Lincoln. Hey, can you see me all right? Can you see everybody now, Lincoln? I can see, let's see, I see Ted Peters, and I think that's Ben Blair. Hey, Ben, how you doing? Great. Apparently, I'm not the only Mormon transhumanist here. the way to do it. All right, cool. Um, I guess a good way to start is to ask if all of you have already read the paper so I can gauge, you know, how much detail I should go into before we launch into a real discussion. I have, yeah. I have not. Okay. So um, I, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll give some summaries of the various sections of the paper. And if I've gone too fast, then I'll back up and, and we'll answer more questions. But I'm, I'm, I'm hoping mostly to make this as a discussion as we go along. So um, don't, please don't hesitate to interrupt me, like wave your hand around or something so I can see it. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to stop and and answer questions and and again I, I'd like this to be as valuable as possible for you and for me and for me that means discussing with you guys because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, brain power and familiarity with religion and its relationship with transhumanism in that room and I I want to benefit from that as much as I imagine you guys would enjoy talking with me about it so um, please do stop me if, uh, if, if, if stuff comes up so maybe a, a good place to start is uh, with Mormonism and kind of set uh, set set a level there for what we're talking about. What what I want to do is is first tell you what Mormonism is for me, and it's important that I that I point out that you know Mormonism today there there's there's over 15 million Mormons theoretically. And, um, you know, some of them identify more as Mormon still than others. Some of, some of them may have, like, subsequently joined other religions and may not be identifying with the movement as much as they did previously. But anyway, there's, there's quite a few Mormons. That's roughly worldwide, my understanding, about the same number of Mormons and Jews. And um, there's multiple Mormon denominations. By far the biggest one is the LDS Church, um, which I'm a member of, and which Ben, who's there in the room with you, is a member of. And uh, um, but there's smaller denominations as well, and there's variation in in our beliefs between the different Mormon denominations. And then, of course, within the LDS Church itself, there's variations in perspectives and interpretations and such. So what the things I'm going to tell you, you know, your mileage will vary in, in how much uh, particular Mormon will see things exactly the same way. And I'll try and I'll try to call that out as we go along. You know, where will a particular Mormon um, that's like um, very mainstream, um, agree with me more, and where will they maybe agree with me less? I'll, I'll try to point that out, and I'll try to be as honest as I can about that, transparent as I can about that. So n nothing to hide there, nothing to shy away from there. And if you have any really like tough questions, you know, what's perceived as tough questions about Mormonism and its relationship with transhumanism, ask those too. I'm, I'm not shy um, of addressing any controversies in my religion and things like that. So for me, and for many Mormons, this, this is not an unusual thing. Mormonism is primarily uh, about an interpretation of Christianity that's immersive. It's an immersive discipleship of Jesus Christ, as, as I often describe it. And what I mean by it being immersive is that it's about taking on as much as we can the identity of Christ as invited and exemplified by Jesus. So here making a distinction between Jesus Christ, Jesus as a person, and say the body of Christ that Jesus invites us into. Not an uncommon idea among Christians generally. Um, for me, Mormonism is a particularly immersive interpretation of that, that I'm supposed to take on this identity in every way I can, as deeply as I can, as broadly as I can. 
that's what Mormonism is for me in a nutshell. And then, of course, from a historical perspective, Mormonism starts with Joseph Smith, um, born in 1805. Um, when he was about 15 years old, he started having visions. Um, he started telling people about those visions. A few years later, he he um, founded the what he called the Church of Christ after after having um, received revelation, as he described it, of what the Book of Mormon should be using some golden plates in the process, or maybe not so much using some golden plates in the process. He claimed to have the plates, but the people that did the uh, translation work with him say that he didn't actually refer to these plates during the process. So if it was a translation, it wasn't a translation in any normal sense. Um, and so he, he started this church. It grew very quickly, but controversially, um, for various reasons, one of the big controversies, of course, was polygamy that he started. And um, he ended up being killed for various of his views. Some of those views were, that were controversial were polygamy. Uh, maybe his views of humanity becoming God were controversial with some people. There was also some controversies about finances and things like that that could have contributed. But for one reason or another, he ended up dead. Um, in 1844, um, not a very old man at the time, and the church kind of um, schismed at that point. And after a period of time, most Mormons followed Brigham Young um, to Utah as pioneers. It's, and you've probably heard the story of the Mormon pioneers. Um, that's where most Mormons went, but some of them stayed in the East and they became other denominations of Mormons after, after a period of time. The reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints followed um, Emma, which was Joseph's wife, and one of Joseph's sons, Joseph Smith III. And um, they, they changed their name actually to the Community of Christ uh, just um, like 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, then there's some other smaller denominations like the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They still practice polygamy today, unlike most other Mormon denominations. Uh, of course, the largest denomination, the LDS Church, we don't practice polygamy. And um, so that, that's kind of how things have gone historically. Um, from Just to give some, some generalities into the, the background of some of the kind of important doctrines as we are thinking about transhumanism in relation to Mormonism, from a metaphysical perspective, Mormonism offers, um, offers doctrines that are consistent with various accounts of naturalism and physicalism, um, in Mormonism, in our scriptures, we talk about mind being material, or all spirit is matter, as Joseph Smith wrote it. God is embodied. Everything is embodied in Mormonism. There's no such thing as disembodied things. Even spirits are have spirit bodies. Um, and the whole, the whole story of the creation of the world in Mormonism is of God finding um, himself in the midst of matter and energy and seeking to organize it according to existing laws making new laws and creating the world that we're now in to give opportunity to other to others to become like God, to become gods themselves, as Joseph Smith described it. Um, as far as theodicy goes, the, the Mormon theodicy is essentially this idea that evil is a necessary risk for the opportunity to create more gods. There's just no other way to do it. Um, in, in, our, in our creation story, we have this idea that there was a grand council in heaven where um, two of the children of God, um, identified as Christ and Satan later on, um, present two different plans. Satan offers a plan for optimizing to mitigate suffering, and Christ offers this plan of optimizing for, to, to cultivate thriving. Um, and if we go with the plan to cultivate thriving, there's going to be real risks. There's going to be real suffering, but there will also be, be real opportunities and, and, and wonderful possibilities. So um, as the story goes, the, the children of God mostly chose the plan of Christ. Some did not, and war in heaven ensued, and that war continues to this day on earth. Um, then, you know, that leads into some Mormon eschatology. Mormon eschatology is about transformation. It's about the transformation of earth into heaven. Heaven is not somewhere else for Mormons. Heaven is here um, on earth, transformed and transfigured to glory. Um, it's about humans becoming God, and, and not just any kind of God. Uh, the kind of God that, that we model becoming in Mormonism is the God that Jesus Christ exemplifies, a compassionate creator. Um, and then, you know, th this carries out through a period of time that we're 
starting with where we are now in, in the fullness of times that we call it in our scriptures. Um, that's also a phrase from the New Testament, where in, in Mormonism we understand this to be a time of rapid change, of accelerated learning. Um, the sciences are expected to flourish. Human education and knowledge are supposed to expand. And that should culminate in this time of apocalyptic risk when there could be great troubles, um, as the prophecies say. And then the return of Christ um, is supposed to happen at that point. And then there's this millennial period of time afterwards where Christ will reign on earth. Um, evil will be bound because of the righteousness of the people, as the scriptures describe it. Uh, notions of poverty and death that we have now will be um, overcome. There will be no more death or, or, or poverty. And it will continue to be a time of learning, however, and transformation. And even during this millennial period, Mormons look at that as a further transformation from the millennial world into what we would call a celestial world. And the celestial world is, is considered to be the abode of God. When God lives on earth, transformed and transfigured with us, and we become God. And um, even in that world, from a Mormon perspective, learning continues, and we continue to, to educate ourselves and, ex and progress um, into higher orders of worlds. So, again, Mormon eschatology is all about this transformation, about this vision of human potential, and um, built on top of a metaphysics that's... Um, that is consistent with physicalism and naturalism. Um, before I go on, any any questions or thoughts about the Mormonism that I'm that I'm talking about here? Uh, very helpful, Agent. Good. Um, I'm going to go on. Good. Any any um, any clarifying questions, or should we go on to uh, the next topic? Uh, just one, uh, eschatologically, do we all become one God, or is it a polytheism with a, uh, a bunch of gods, all of whom, each of whom uh, embodies the qualities of, of Christ? That depends on the Mormon that you ask. So um, my, my own inclination is that communities become God and that we participate in the divine nature with God that already exists. So you could look at my per perspective on this as kind of a hybrid between maybe the two poles that you suggested. I don't, I don't buy entirely into a monism and I don't buy entirely into a pluralism. I think that there's um, a, there's much, much, room, even a pregnancy of possibility in pulling those concepts together. Um, I have a lot of personal affinity towards e Eastern Orthodox interpretations of theosis, but I'm also not, uh, I don't feel constrained to them, although I find a lot of them very beautiful. So um, you'll, you'll, you'll talk to Mormons who will, who will talk about theosis in very individualistic ways, where you know, each person is destined to be an independent God of an independent universe with independent creation. And, you know, that's interesting. And um, there's aspects of that that I value in the sense that I think that there's a lot that each individual can bring to this communal divinization um, as far as creative works go. But I also don't like this kind of competitive or individualistic um, um, kind of separate separation that happens with an excessive emphasis on that kind of interpretation. So um, maybe I'm waffling, but my, I guess my answer to your question is, for me, it's a little bit of both. Okay, thanks. All right. Let's go ahead and, and talk then a, a little bit more about what I call post-secular religion. And this gets talked about in different ways by different people. Um, the, the function that post-secular religion serves for me is as it's a way of acknowledging kind of my own history and also what I think is a common history among religious transhumanists, whether they're Mormon or not. Um, and that is that we value and have learned a lot from secularism. There's so much that good that secularism has brought to the world. 
Now, not uniquely good, that's not what I'm suggesting, but nonetheless, good has been done by secular perspectives on the world. Um, but they're also insufficient. And, you know, in my, own, in my own life and in the lives of many other religious transhumanists that I've spoken with, there's this sense that, you know, we have these ancient tra religions, these ancient traditions that we've inherited, and we found that there's both value and maybe some not so much value in them. And, that, and so then we looked at secularism and we found value there, but we also found that it lacked some things that religion gave to us. And so with post-secularism, as I look at it, it's, it's a way of trying to pull out the value of both the ancient and the modern in our cultural traditions, in our cultural evolution, and pull them together and say, hey, you know what, maybe there's value that we can pull from both and we ought to pull from both. So, um, you know, there's the secularization hypothesis that um, we've reached, <laughs> by some accounts, the end of history. And, you know, at this point, everybody's going to become secular because of, obviously, um, it, all of the ancient religions are superstition, superstitious nonsense and we're all educated now and it's time to give them up. Well, um, as, as all of you are probably aware, given your educational backgrounds, there's a lot of there's a lot of movement away from that secular secularization hypothesis now in in more educated circles where people are realizing that you know while religion in the Western world in Europe in the United States does seem like traditional forms of it in some educated and prosperous places are weakening there are other things that are kind of taking its place that can't strictly be described by secularization. And of course, broadly in the world at large, religion is not dying at all. And in fact, um, in, in many places, it's growing faster than ever before. So um, in particular then, let, I wanna talk about three, three ways of looking at post-secular religion. One is with God. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to look at God from a post-secular perspective. A way that I like to introduce a post-secular perspective on God is that God at least functions as a superhuman projection. You know, you don't you don't have to buy into anything more than that to get started um, with with theology from a post-secular perspective. In the very least, you know, God is a superhuman projection. Is there a question there? Yeah, when you by projection, are you do you have in mind uh, like square box? I think that's a sufficient start, except for the word just. Um, I, 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 would, I would explain to somebody that as soon as they're introducing that God is just that, they've shut down their mind to the ramifications that God is at least that. And that is that as even if God began as nothing more than that, that has practical consequences. Projecting our virtues projecting negations of our vices, thinking about those, talking about those, acting on those, that changes me, that changes my community, that changes our world, and, if, and the most powerful and practical projections end up realizing themselves. And so it's, um, I think it's a, it's a bad hypothesis to suggest that God is only a projection. God's, God is embodied in the very least at, beyond that in us through the influence of that projection, and then the most powerful forms of those projections probably go to their realization a lot further than that. And, and later on, maybe we'll, we can talk about how this um, is exemplified in the new God argument. Um, another, another thing that I talk about from a post-secular perspective is prophecy. Um, how, how can we approach prophecy from a post-secular perspective? Well, prophecy at least functions as forth-telling. You know, we don't have to worry about it being foretelling or fortune telling or or perfect infallible prediction. We can look at prophecy as forth telling. And there's a good tradition for this um, in the Bible itself. You know, you've got in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, Jonah going to the city of Nineveh um, after the part with the fish. He finally gets there and God says, Jonah, tell Nineveh they'll be destroyed. He doesn't say God, or Jonah, tell Nineveh they'll be destroyed if they don't repent. That's not part of it. You read the, if you read the passages, it says just, God just tells Jonah to say, hey, go tell them they're going to be destroyed. So Jonah does that. 
tells Nineveh they'll be destroyed. He goes up to the mountain, starts eating his popcorn to watch the destruction. Well, Nineveh repents. They're not destroyed. Jonah gets pissed off at God. God says, hey, get over it. That's the whole point. Sorry, that's not exactly how it went down, but um, that's my summary of it. So um, the idea here is that prophecy has its value in its interactivity, um, in the way that it influences um, our community, the way that it kind of warns us of risks to avoid and encourages us towards opportunities to pursue, and that that's a legitimate function, and that a prophet is somebody who, who can tap in effectively into these aesthetics um, that provoke us to pursue those opportunities or to avoid those risks. And that kind of leads into a post-secular account of religion, where religion, in the very least, functions as any practice that provokes a communal strenuous mood. So, you know, prophecy feeds into this. The prophet can provoke the community to act on the prophecy. Um, rituals can function the same way. They can, they can influence our thoughts and our words and our behaviors. And then, so religion is, from this perspective, in the very least, it's this social technology that we can use to do either wonderful things or horrible things. There's nothing in this definition that says religion's inherently good or evil. It's just a power. It's social power to be used for one or the other. We can become religious about horrible things or we can become religious about wonderful things and that, would, that will motivate their realization. Um, so uh, that, that's uh, post-secular religion. Any, any comments or questions about uh, those views? Thank you, Ted. All right, um, technological evolution. This, this, uh, this next topic, this leads into transhumanism, not quite there yet, though. Uh, basically, when people think about technological evolution today, there's all kinds of aesthetics that come to mind. Some of them are really bad aesthetics. You know, sometimes people think of the cyborg with the gun arm and the laser eye and they go, why on earth would you want to be like that? Well, the answer is I don't want to be like that. And I don't know many people who do want to be like that. But technological evolution, um, while conceivably it could devolve into, into cases of gun arms and laser eyes, it has been many more practical and beautiful things than that so far. You know. We've got our glasses and we've got our clothing and we've got drugs and surgeries and implants and medicine and agriculture. These are all historical examples of technological evolution. All of these things have been affecting our biological evolution and our cultural evolution. And things like them are continuing to influence us. So we're now imagining the potential of our biotechnology and our nanotechnology enhancements to change our bodies and our brains in ways that we never had before. So things are becoming more controversial and for good reason, right? Because the things are becoming increasingly dangerous. But along with those risks, there are increasing opportunities. So why are we doing this? You know, why technological evolution? Well, it's not merely because somebody thinks it would be cool to have a gun arm or a laser eye. It's about power and that might sound cold, but it doesn't need to just be cold. Power is just a tool. It's like we were talking about with religion. Religion can be good, be used for good or used for evil. The same thing with technology. We're going to continue to use technology to change ourselves because it empowers us towards the ends that we value. We pluralistically, right? And, and some of those things that we value are going to be things that we in this room are going to think are horrible. And they're going to be things that we in this room think are wonderful. Technology will be used, has been used, and will be used for both. And likely, um, you know, likely it will be lots of things that are more ambiguous than that most of the time. But perhaps we can use technology, technology to, increase, to increasingly develop something that, that approaches our perceptions of heaven. Or some people may, because of antisocial tendencies, maybe um, pathology, psychopathologies, whatever, they might be using technology to create what's approaching our conceptions of hell. I, I think that both are possible. I'd like to think, and I'm optimistic, that most of us are going to influence the trajectory of technology 
toward creating something that approaches our conceptions of heaven. Do I see a hand? Yes. Uh, does this connect directly or indirectly with the creation where Satan and Christ have this division, and now does it manifest itself with either the positive or the negative use of technology, or are those disconnected? Yeah, those, in, in, for a typical Mormon, if you were to talk about these sorts of things in a Mormon Sunday school, the comment that you just made would go over great. People would say, oh, yeah, we can see that this there's this ongoing tension between good and evil in the ways that we use technology. That's that's a that's a common discussion in a Mormon Sunday school. Oh yeah, thank you for the clarif. I I couldn't quite hear what you said, but I think you were saying Sunday schools for adults too. Yes. 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 Yeah, that's accurate. Yeah, that, that may not be the case in, in um, all denominations, of course. But yes, in the LDS Church, there are Sunday school classes for children, for teenagers, and for adults um, with different subjects for the age groups. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Any, any other questions or comments about technological? Yeah, please. You, uh, you mentioned that there, most of us probably have visions of using technology for, uh, for creation creating our image of heaven, but what about the fact that a lot of times um, this use of power gets concentrated in the hands of a few? It's not maybe so much that those who have it are trying to create hell on earth, but it's more like they may not be as uh, attuned to the problems of the rest of us. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm totally there with you. Tech in itself is not sufficient for creating heaven. Anybody who thinks so needs to go take some classes in sociology or or ethics or whatever. Um, technology is just a power be, to be used and, and we're gonna use it wrong often. And one way that we might misuse technology is by concentrating it in, in the hands of a few and using it to perpetuate that concentration. That's very definitely possible. In, in many ways, we see that happening today, right? Um, in some other ways though, I, I, I see some some very um, in, 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 you know inspiring and um, things that make me want to be more optimistic, and that is that we're also seeing decentralization of certain kinds of technology, uh, such as, you know, blockchain technology that could be used for both financial and governance applications. We're seeing that the, the costs of certain kinds of technologies related to energy and manufacturing and, and knowledge acquisition are coming down rapidly and being distributed more broadly than ever before. So, yeah, I think we're seeing some of both, and um, I think it's a legitimate and very important concern that you raised, and tech alone can't solve that. We have we have to make choices as we enhance our own intelligence, our own morality. We can only ever do so from the place where we currently are. And so ethics, morality, um, debate, the, these these sorts of things that human institutions have been have been cultivating for a long time have a very important place and role to play in the ongoing trajectory of our technological evolution. Other questions or thoughts? All right, so let's talk a little bit about transhumanism. I'm, I'm going to assume that you all, that everybody in this room like knows what transhumanism is, so I'm not, I'm not going to belabor that. What I'm, what I'm going to focus on in my account of transhumanism, but, but first, you know, before that, one step back, let me just define what transhumanism is for me. Transhumanism for me is, is advo advocacy for the ethical use of technology to extend human abilities. Nothing more nor less than that. If that's what you're doing, if you're engaged in this advocacy, you are a transhumanist. The advocacy for the ethical use of technology to extend human abilities. Ethical is key, in my opinion. I don't think you're engaged in transhumanism if you're just doing cheerleading for technology. Um, I think that many critics of transhumanism um, make a mistake and target indiscriminate cheerleading of technology as transhumanism. I think that's a straw man of transhumanism. If, if you're not if you're not uh, if you're not taking the ethics of it seriously, um, you're you're probably not a, a good example of transhumanism in my book. So with that definition of transhumanism, as, as you all probably know, most transhumanists uh, like to trace origins of transhumanism back through 
secularism and back through humanism. But, uh, you know, I'm a religious transhumanist, so as you might imagine, I, I have some reservations with the way that transhumanists construct our history. And the first reservation I have is the idea that humanism is some sort of opposite of religion. I think that's a big mistake. In fact, I think a strong argument can be made, um, probably by experts um, better educated than me, that humanism as we know it today is a product of Christianity in many ways. And if not just Christianity, then even of religion more broadly. And that the two, while they have in, 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 um, in our modern era come, come to um, kind of resist each other, some of the more traditional religious interpretations have come to resist some of the more humanistic perspectives on life. Um, I, I would suggest that some of that is because of unnecessary dogmatism um, that some religious traditions have held on to. But in any case, humanism itself probably got its, is argu ar arguably got its start from um, religious origins. And then, you know, there's some great examples of religious um, proto-transhumanists, people who influenced the rise of transhumanism from a religious perspective. Uh, one great example of that is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, Jesuit priest of the 20th century, uh, talked about Omega, Omega Point, talked about human, uh, uh, humanity creating um, a noosphere, uh, this kind of um, integrated human um, consciousness, intelligence, maybe something like the internet, um, as people have gone back and, and looked at, at, the, at his works and suggested he may have been talking about something like that. And a lot of the ideas of de Chardin um, are, are very, um, you know, seem to have made their way into the ideas of people like Ray Kurzweil today. You know, Kurzweil doesn't, so far as I know, um, directly refer to de Chardin, but man, there are so many parallels. I, I would be shocked if Kurzweil um, hadn't read de Chardin or wasn't, in, wasn't um, influenced by people that had read de Chardin at one point in his life or another. Another great example of a proto-religious transhumanist is Nikolai Fedorov, a Russian Orthodox priest. Um, really, this guy, this guy inspires me to no end. Um, I, 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 he had this idea that the common task of humanity should be the resuscitative resurrection of all humanity um, through by natural mechanisms, um, using technology that it would bring us all together in this work to re resurrect all of our ancestors. And, and th that, that idea um, resonates strongly with um, my Mormonism and the, and the way that many others look at their Mormonism. Um, uh, other examples of, of you know, kind of proto-religious transhumanism, we could look at how the 13th century scholastic theologians integrated uh, religion with the science of their day, which was resurgent Aristotelianism. We can look at early Christians integrating with Neoplatonism, which was the science of their day, um, and the importance of this re repeated integration of, of science and religion for practical purposes. There's a lot of proto-transhumanism in that. And then maybe most inspiring of all for me is uh, this, this very ancient idea of theosis that we can track back through Christianity very strongly and then we can also find in, in other religions broadly throughout the world this idea that humanity can and should become God. Um, it's not taught, um, you know, really openly among most major world religions today, but it's still there. Um, Catholicism still teaches about divinization. Most Catholics don't seem to talk about it very much. Um, they might interpret it differently than I do, but the, but the idea of divinization is still, you know, in the doctrines of Catholicism. Um, and we can also, of course, find really strong examples of the idea of theosis today, particularly among Mormons, which teach it very strongly. And then Eastern Orthodox Christians have the, have the idea of apotheosis, too, that they continue to teach. Um, and this goes back thousands of years. It's not a new idea. And, you, you know, you go read the, the works of... Athanasius, or you, Augustine talked about it, Clement talked about it, Origen talked about it. Theosis is not a new idea. It's an ancient and abiding idea. And um, when, when interpreted in a practical way, 
you know, not not merely a, a a mystical way, which some people interpret it, you know, as a uniquely mystical transformation. But if interpreted in a practical way, as some have advocated it, I can't think of anything that's more proto-religious transhumanist than the idea of practical theosis. Um, so uh, when, a, when a secular transhumanist tells me, hey, um, the origins go back through secular lines, I, I kind of laugh and say, no, dude, I think there's way more religious influence on the rise of transhumanism than there is secular. So questions, Ted? Uh, the word practical, it could be technological or it could be moral. Uh, it could be moral. Which one there is an accommodation I I lost the middle of what you said. It could be it could be technological or what? Practical. Does it mean technological or does it mean moral? Oh, moral. Gotcha. Right. Yes. Um, I personally I think um, morality is a very important part of it, and I think that almost all advocates of theosis would agree that theosis essential to theosis is moral transformation. Um, among other things, um, but by practical, I actually mean both. And so, if you go if you go into um, the New Testament, one one of my one of my favorite uh, writers in the New Testament, um, the book of James, my mother my mother uh, kind of uh, hammered this into my head as a kid. She she was she converted to Mormonism from Catholicism. She actually had planned to become a nun. Uh, prior to meeting my father, and they, and anyway, that's kind of a fun story. But she became a Mormon, and she raised me um, to understand Mormonism, as as many Mormon mothers do. This is not unusual to interpret faith in a very practical way. Yes, grace is very important. It's pervasive and persistent. Not everything we do depends on grace. But within that context of grace, work in a very practical sense. Um, Moral work, but also the work of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, using the means we have, the tools at our disposal to do the work of God is very important. And in fact, as James would say in the New Testament, faith without such works is dead. Um, so that, that has informed my own Mormonism all my life. And um, that's a very common thing among Mormons to emphasize that aspect of Christianity. Yeah. One of the things, and I, I don't have a, I don't have a dog in the hunt on this question, but it's simply one that I observe uh, broadly, and that is that in in Mormonism, in in, in most Salvific religions, um, there is a moral imperative to improve yourself, to do certain things, and to activate that grace so that you reach the state of whatever your apotheosis is, whatever your grand final uh, uh, resting place is, or working place, whatever we, we call it. Um, but with technological transhumanism, uh, you can get right to that ultimate state, ultimately, that you're talking about. That is, uh, uh, you know, immortality as well as increased uh, power over the natural world and so on and so forth. There's, there are no moral uh, requirements for that. Anybody can do it. You can get the worst, the, the most horrific ethical monster in the world, and you could make him, because he's got the same body that I do, you could make him immortal. You could give him all kinds of great power, and you can inject him into the the uh, computer noosphere that we're all going to we're all going to share our thoughts to. I don't get where there's anything that, that's required that we would call good. It's, there's, there's no good involved. The ticket is simply you pay for the e-ticket you know, at Disneyland. That's it. So so where does it fit religiously for everyone? Yeah. Because everyone can have this. Yeah, great question. Um, let, let me begin by saying um, Mormons will, depending on the Mormon you ask, they'll have a different account of grace. Let me say that for me, everything depends on grace. Grace is not something that has to be activated. Grace is something that I require at every second and receive at every second from God. Um, and we could get into a, a deeper discussion about what I mean by that. But I just, I, I wanted to clarify that for me and 
some other Mormons, not all, because there will be different accounts of grace in Mormonism. Grace is not something that needs to be activated. It's pervasive and persistent. Um, morality. Can we create, can we become God? Can we become Christ through no moral work at all, just through technological enhancement? Well, um, a, a, a few important things come to mind here, and, we'll, and we may talk about these again later when we talk about the new God argument. But one of the important uh, things to consider is something that Nick Bostrom talks about when he, when he has done his work into superintelligence. Nick Bostrom talks about something called a dynamic constraint. Yes, it's conceivable that we might create an intelligence in the possibility space of intelligence that could be very, very powerful, but within, but it may not last very long because of the way it operates in the world. This is a dynamic constraint. So there may be certain things that are conceivably possible for a snapshot of time, but that cannot persist. And there's many kinds of intelligences that we can imagine that would succumb, their existence would succumb to such dynamic constraints. So one of the th one of the things that um, we'll talk about later in the in the New God argument is the idea of, of compassion and it's and it's or if you want to use like maybe a, a more prosaic or a more secular term cooperation is a key element to the persistence and the ratcheting up and the ability to continue to pursue further advances in the technology. So if we if we don't cooperate enough to manage nuclear weapons, then we'll destroy ourselves and no, have no opportunity to develop um, biotechnology. If we don't cooperate enough in our use of biotechnology, then we won't live long enough to improve nanotechnology. If we don't cooperate enough in our use of nanotechnology, then we won't be around long enough to develop artificial general intelligence and integrate ourselves with it. If we don't use that well enough and we destroy ourselves with that, well, then we won't be around long enough to um, compute um, new worlds or, or engage in cosmoforming or whatever the furthest out imaginations of a transhumanist might be. So what I'm suggesting by this is that there are, there are built in natural hurdles to technological progress. And those natural hurdles have everything to do with what we call ethics, cooperation, morality, um, pro-sociality, um, interconnection, so society building, all of these things that, that, um, are, that we concern ourselves with, with um, when we talk about ethics and morality. Now, am I a fatalist about this? Do I think that it's impossible for an evil God to be created? No, I don't think it's impossible. And in fact, in the Mormon um, creation mythology that we were talking about earlier, um, the very idea of Mormon, the Mormon origin story is that there was an evil God that rose and proposed this idea that, you know what, we can create a world where there is no risk, where there's no risk of suffering, where there's no risk of evil. We can do that. Um, the, the opposing plan proposed by the good God was, well, listen, if we create that kind of world, there will be no opportunity to develop new genuinely creative agents that have really experienced true compassion, true courage. And, and there's just certain kinds of things that can only be experienced in a world that's set up and optimized for thriving instead of set up to mitigate suffering. So in the Mormon cosmology, in the Mormon mythos, hmm, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Oh, okay. I was worried it might be me. Um, in the Mormon mythology, there is this idea that while on the whole, moral advance, advancement in, in compassion, cooperation, advancement in charity, moral enhancement is essential to persisting in power enhancement, but even after advancing in power, there could be people, there could be, as the myth goes, gods or children of God that misuse that power 
fall from heaven and perpetuate this cycle of what Mormons call the war in heaven. So, you know, to your point, it, 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 there's nothing there's nothing that we can, we can look at in this that's like obviously pre- preventing evil applications of technology at any point along the way. I agree with that. But what I would say is that there's much to suggest that there are dynamic constraints on all of them. You know, maybe evil gods can, gods can rise, but how long can evil gods persist? That's the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't. I, I, I'm I'm cut off right in the middle of Ted's head. I'll just sit right on Ted's lap here. Um, <clears throat> I have sort of a meta question to all of that. Um, so, if 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 the Mormons for the kingdom of God and the children of God living there, if that's something that's resuscitated, as you said here, um, through transhumanism, and that's done here on Earth. Yeah. Right. Supposed to be in the fullness of relationship, when if you're having the kingdom of God here, God's not here. Yeah. So um, one one thing to point out there is that there there may be um, religions or interpretations of religions that are inconsistent with transhumanism. That you know that that's a possibility, and in in and in actual fact, in the way that some people live and understand their religions, they clearly are incompatible with most transhumanist ideas. Um, but that being said, um, you know, there, there, are, there is more to this idea than um, might initially meet the eye. So for example, let, let's, just, let's take this from, from just, you know, what is arguably, now, and, and this could open a can of worms, but what is arguably kind of a biblical perspective? You know, Christians interpret the Bible in many ways. But um, there's good reason um, you know, you can make a, a decent case from the Bible that um, in the book of Revelation, it describes heaven and earth being renewed, this earth becoming, um, you know, a renewed place and God reigning on this earth. So that's not a novel idea um, from a biblical perspective. There's also an idea in the Bible that not everyone will die, as Paul says. That's a, the mystery that he's going to, to share with us, a, a great secret he's going to share with us. We'll not all die. We'll not, we'll, not, we'll not all sleep, as he puts it. But that we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye to immortality, and the dead will rise. And, you know, we, in, in the Bible, you know, there's, there's talk about, um, you know, when Jesus reappears to his disciples, um, they fear that they see a ghost. And he says, no, touch me. See, I've got flesh and bone, that's, you know, I'm not a ghost, I have flesh and bone, touch me, and then he eats something as if to prove it. So there's there's good reason to suppose that most of the world, since, you know, re- Christianity is presently the largest religion on the planet, most of the world has some biblical um, reasons, if they want to ad- adopt them, to suppose that heaven can be here on earth, that God can be embodied. Um, but let, let me let me take that a step further with you because you know some people say well then then how do we like connect with God now because we imagine God um, you know being you know answering our prayers maybe um, relating with us spiritually somehow and and I'm among the people who uh, pray and 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 feel a relationship with God right now um, that is um, different than I would say my relationship is with another human embodied in, say, California. Now, right now, we have this connection going on, which I'm, I'm going to take advantage of in an analogy in a moment. But um, one of the far-out ideas of some transhumanists is, the, is that, that in the future we'll have immense computing capacity and we'll use that capacity um, to do, among other things, world simulations. We'll... we'll, we'll, we'll emulate our own evolutionary history, worlds like the one that we have already lived in, 
for all kinds of reasons. Maybe, you know, some people suppose it would be for entertainment or for research. I kind of suppose it would be to create more beings like ourselves, to create more creators. Um, but let's say that we use technology to do such a thing um, and, and, and hold that proposition out and up there for just a second and now look at our past and the trajectory of how do we get there. Well, if you look at our past and you look at where our technology has come from, you know, our computers historically, they were massive machines in warehouses far away. So there was a separation between the computer and me. Over time, the computers got more sophisticated. They got smaller, faster, more powerful. And we brought them into our homes. We put them in, onto our desks. Over time, those computers got smaller, faster, more sophisticated, and we started putting them in our pockets. We started putting them up next to our ears. We have started embedding them in our bodies, and they're still getting more and more powerful, smaller and faster. You know, so as we imagine this, the, the computing power of the future, I think it would be a mistake to imagine the world being computed in a computer on a desktop computer, right? A, 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 you know, the world we're in is being computed on, in this desktop computer and God being somebody looking at the computer like somebody looking at desktop dot computer. I think that's a mistake because the trajectory of the technology, of the computing technology, is to become increasingly intimate and integrated with us as persons. So as I imagine the relationship between massive computing power and God, I think they're the same thing. And when I talk about the computer, when I talk about God, I'm talking about the same thing. And so if I'm living in a world that God computes as our creator, then I'm something like the thoughts of God. I'm part of the anatomy of God. And in the same way that a computer can communicate with all of its parts, God can communicate with me, can experience with me, can know everything about me in the same way a computer can know everything about the bits on its hard drives and in its memory. So, um, you know, how, how, do we, how do we combine this? How do we get to heaven in this idea where earth becomes heaven? Well, you know, maybe we're already connected with that heaven very intimately, and our job is to evolve our part of heaven, our part of God, into greater union with an expression of that divinity, kind of grow up into the divine nature, partake of the divine nature, as Peter puts it in the New Testament. And that, personally, I see no contradiction between the idea of earth becoming heaven, humanity becoming God, and also looking at God as transcendent and being more than just our earth and our humanity becoming divine. Does that answer your question? It does part of it, um, but I'm, I'm thinking about how if, when I read Revelation in my tradition, it's that God initiates those actions of renewing heaven and earth. And I don't see where um, God's initiating any of this transhumanist action that would lead towards a, a kingdom of heaven being here on earth. I'm wondering where divine action is, you know, or is it that what humans are doing in trans with the transhumanist protocol is supposed to bring God here. If the humans are the actor or what God's action. Yeah, so who, you, I, if I understand your correct question correctly, you're asking, you know, who, who's responsible for making this happen? Is it just humanity? It, it, am, I, am I saying that, you know, humans are doing all the work? Um, so my, my answer to that is no. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that humans are called by God to participate in the work. And, you know, if you, if you and I um, sat down next to each other and pulled out a Bible, we, you know, we might not always agree on how to interpret various passages of it. But what I can tell you is that, you know, from, from, my, from, from where I'm sitting and from my study of, of, the, of the Bible, which I value highly, um, I find that the New Testament, that Jesus in particular, is constantly inviting me to participate in the work that he exemplifies and that he has, is repeatedly encouraging me to raise my eyes to the potential that we have to participate in 
um, the creation of this new heaven and earth together with God. Um, you know, as, as Paul puts it in the New Testament, that we might become joint heirs in the glory of God, if so be that we suffer together. And, you know, as James, as I already referenced earlier, um, you know, this faith that we have in this new heaven and earth, that's awesome. You know, the demons believe too, but all they do is tremble. James wants us to do more than tremble in, in, in our faith, but to engage in the works that change the world around us, feeding the hungry and clothing the naked, and using the means we have available for doing so, which are different than they were 2,000 years ago. So um, I, I want to fully acknowledge that, you know, not all religious people, not all people who, who value the Bible are going to agree with my interpretation. I, I, I totally recognize that. Um, what I'm asking, what I, what I would ask you to do is to, um, to recognize that um, I see the Bible calling us to participate in the work of God and getting to an agreement about whether it does and to how much extent it does might be a lot of work between any two people that value the Bible. Does that help? All right. Um, the next the next topic I wanted to talk about was um, you know kind of extending on. I was talking about how transhumanism, beyond just its secular um, origins, has arguably has strong religious origins. I want to talk about present day transhumanism and how it very often functions as misrecognized religion. You know. Most people, when they think of transhumanism, they think of a bunch of atheists. Um, and there are a fair number of atheist transhumanists. However, if you go look at the polls, the demographic polls of websites like the Institute um, for Ethics and Emerging Technology, which is uh, one of the largest um, websites for transhumanists, you'll find that the number of people who identify as religious transhumanists of one kind or another has increased, um, at least over the last two or three polls that IEET has done over the last decade. And so, you know, you might wonder, well, well, how is that? You know, we hear we hear all these things about, um, you know, the transhumanism being a rejection of religion. Well, why would there be more religious transhumanists today than there were 10 years ago? Um, well, there I, there's a few reasons that that come to mind, and there and there may be others. But one of the reasons that may be is that it may be that some transhumanists are getting tired of kind of the zealous anti-religiosity of a lot of the new atheists. You know, there's some transhumanists that have tried to create this strong ideological association between new, new atheism and transhumanism, but that's really, that's really kind of alienated some transhumanists. Even some atheist transhumanists have been alienated by that attempt. And so they've kind of pressed back on that, say, hey, transhumanism is something distinct from atheism. Another, another reason why we might be seeing more religious transhumanists is that more of them might be realizing that religion um, and transhumanism can be complementary, not just like even just coexisting, but they can actually complement each other that a person's transhumanism and a person's religion can feed off of each other and motivate each other. And I think the reason they're starting to see that is that we have now stronger examples of that actually happening. You know, you've got the Mormon Transhumanist Association that's been around for over a decade now, uh, has over 600 members, and it's pretty well known among transhumanists that the association exists, that these are genuinely religious people, and that we're very transhumanist. In fact, Many of us are more radically transhumanist than some trans than you know many transhumanists are secular transhumanists. So it seems to be pretty clear that at least some kinds of religion complement transhumanism and can kind of provoke greater enthusiasm for transhumanism. And then even beyond that, it may be the case that there's some transhumanist ideas that are really hard to hold on to and advocate without admitting a certain kind of theology or religiosity or adhering to even adhering to a certain kind of theology. And 
one of the strongest of the examples of that, of course, is the simulation argument. If you as a transhumanist are going to buy into the idea that we can ultimately use technology to emulate our evolutionary history with conscious persons, it's pretty hard to like start rejecting theology at that point. Um, and it, it may even be utterly um, illogical and impractical even to uh, reject theology at that point. So, so while transhumanism's not transhumanism's not inherently a religion, there's nothing about the ethical use of technology to extend human abilities that must be religious. It nonetheless still functions as religion for many people. You know, um, just to draw some analogies, there's the sacraments. Of, of nutrition supplements, there's the, the, uh, the rituals of cryonics, there's prophecies of indefinite life extension, there's the spirits of substrate independent minds, there's the apocalyptic and messianic postures that people have towards artificial intelligence and super intelligence, um, there's millennial hopes for future abundance, and, and then ultimately, of course, there's this pantheon of super intelligence at the end of the, of the aspirations. And so um, while transhumanism isn't necessarily a religion, it nonetheless, in my opinion, very clearly functions as religion for many transhumanists. Any thoughts or questions on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, can you... Um... Usually when you talk about religion, you talk about whatever provokes to a strenuous mood. And now you're talking about kind of the rights or the, the how we're more familiar talking about religion, the sacraments, the rights, these aspirations. Could you link those two together? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, you know, if we go back to the, like the very, the simplest expression of post-secular religion that I introduced you guys to early on has been pointed out. This idea that religion is at least this provocation, this this any practice that prom provokes a communal strenuous mood. Well, what is transhumanism if not an advocacy? You know, it is about provoking and, and positioning and getting people to care about these things. You know, think of think of the various transhumanist organizations you know. They're not just engaged in research. These people are, by and large, positioning themselves for advocacy. And to the extent that, they're do, that that advocacy is reaching strenuous levels, that's really motivating people to action, that, for me, fills or, or, or fits the definition of post-secular religion, the function of religion. Other questions or comments on that? All right. So, um, yeah, question. One, one aspect of religious life that I consider to be really valuable is um, the necessity to uh, to enter silence and to meditate and to uh, be able to uh, sort of absorb wisdom that you're not necessarily inhabiting in your day-to-day -day life. And the aspect, especially of information technology, which is so crucial to all of these developments, is that right now they worship just fire hoses of data as opposed to simple meditation. And, and simple ways of being. I, I, I really have a hard time understanding how one gets overlaid on the other, how anything that, that, that to me, reflects the, the meditative life, the calm life, the one that's actually willing to look at, at aspects of my own living and critique it. And I don't see that in the world of technology. Yeah. Uh, at least it's not an idea of their aspirations right now. Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, do, is there a room for contemplative aspects of religion? Um, the more spiritual, the more 
subtly aesthetic aspects of religion. And my answer to that is, I, I think, um, not, not think, I know of a certainty that there is, and here's why. Um, I, I, I happen to, my day job right now, I'm starting a business that sells nootropics. And one of the um, most important applications of nootropics is to alleviate stress and put people into a relaxed and positive frame of mind. Um, so, and, and there's other examples of using um, biofeedback, neurofeedback, and things to relieve stress and depression and anxiety, to help people sleep better, to help people get into modes of thought that are very conducive to contemplation. Um, for me personally, these sorts of tools, in addition to kind of the old fashioned meditative prayer practices, which I continue to practice myself, um, these other tools help me get into states of mind that help me contemplate scripture better, that help me um, be more mindful of my family, that help me be a better person insofar as like serving people around me is concerned. Um, when I'm not paralyzed by stress, I happen to be somebody who has a history of being prone to anxiety. When I'm not suffering from that, I am through most normal pro-social measures, a better person. And um, technology has helped me with that in tangible ways, measurable ways. Um, so I, I want to, there, there's a lot more I could get into. Um, I want to give time to the respondent that I know we have. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that the things that I didn't get into so much were kind of a narrative of how this plays out in the future from a common Mormon transhumanist perspective. Um, that's in the paper. Some of you have read that. Awesome. Keep that in mind. And then I was, I would, would have, if we had more time and if we have more time later, great. I would have talked a little bit more about kind of the doctrinal argument for Mormon transhumanism. Why from, from my perspective and the perspective of many Mormon transhumanists, Mormonism actually mandates transhumanism at a doctrinal level. And then I wanted to share, um, some ideas about the new God argument with you, which is a popular argument for faith in God that religious transhumanists uh, like a lot. So those things are in the paper. You can read more about them there. We'll talk more about them later if we have time. But right now I want to make sure we give time to the respondent. I see you great, thanks. And can you see the screen? Yes, I see it now, yes. All right, good, then we're all set to go. So, um... I love the title. The, oh, the, the, the title or the subtitle? The subtitle. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a, a second. Um, I th I'm glad that I actually had the chance to have you speaking with us. Um, there's a funny story... Uh, a while ago, uh, Brian and a friend of mine from Utah were arguing some point on Lincoln's Facebook, uh, something that you posted, and it's very, this is a real moment where people from one part of my life and people from another <laughs> part of my life were interacting. Um, and so I'm glad that I actually get to talk to you, and now I have, there's like the, the triangle is complete. Cool. Um, I, the, the title, I am, I guess I would identify as an apostate, so this first part will be a bit of a confession, and I haven't really given this kind of talk before people. I, uh, Bob Reese, who um, is affiliated with the GTU, knows this about me, but not many other people do. I grew up in the Mormon church, grew up in the LDS uh, church. I was raised in Ogden, Utah. My parents were married in the Ogden Temple. My older brothers went on missions. One went to Albania. The other went as far away as Kentucky. Um, I did not go on a mission. I am the third of six children. Uh, my name is Levi, which fits if you know the Bible. Um, and so, and I was, you know, I was your sort, sort of stereotypical Mormon boy throughout uh, young adult life. I was 
leader in the teachers quorum, the deacons quorum. I was the uh, first counselor, or the first assistant in the priest quorum. I was the president of my seminary class, which is not seminary how we normally think of it out here. And so uh, I have this background, and uh, during college I left the LDS church and became Catholic, and that's not part of the story for today. So um, an interesting ha thing happened, and uh, we're going to be talking about Mormonism, uh, or, or my own perspectives as somebody who was raised Mormon, not from my perspective as a Catholic uh, ethicist, but just as somebody who grew up in the LDS church, what do I think, uh, how do I see transhumanism and LDS, LDS doctrine coming together? And a sort of interesting thing that happened over the course of the Thanksgiving break, I was having a conversation with my father, who is still a very devout and very faithful Mormon, about some of these things we're talking about. And uh, we ended up talking about sci-fi, sci not really what the transhumanists are doing, but we ended up talking about sci-fi, we ended up talking about transporter technology from Star Trek, and uh, we were talking about, well, you know, in order to actually accomplish this, you'd have to document every single atom of the person you're breaking down, you have to transmit that information a long distance away, and then reassemble it on the other side, and my dad, who's a thoroughgoing uh, Mormon, and as Lincoln mentioned before, Mormons believe that the spirit is material. He said, well, you know, even if they could accomplish that, they wouldn't get the person on the other side because they didn't know that the spirit has to be uh, decomposed and transferred either. And it was a sort of like twilight zone moment <laughs> because you're talking about these things that are really like, if you think that you can actually transfer a person from point A to point B, um, you're probably not a religious, or you probably don't put much stock in the spirit existing one way or another. But is a very, like, I think, uh, good point for what we're talking about here. Yeah. So he said, you know, fear will be left behind. Um, as, as Lincoln mentioned, Mormonism is a fairly young religion, and it's post-Newtonian, and, it, and that's a fairly interesting point about it, that even the Book of Mormon talks about the earth going around the sun and not the other way around. And uh, the... The creation story talks about God organizing matter and not creation ex nihilo. So there's a lot of um, important materialist aspects to Mormonism. And there's an, another part that's, that's worth noting is that Mormonism does not have theology the way that Lutheranism, Catholicism, and other traditions do. So Adam Miller, who has come out here, he's one of the most uh, well-known advocates for Mormon theology, and he writes in his book, uh, Rube Goldberg machines that Mormon theology is basically a hobby. It has no practical function. It doesn't do anything. And the biggest reason is because the Mormon church, or the LDS church, I should be more specific, as Lincoln pointed out, the LDS church is much more hierarchical and much more rigid than even the Catholic churches. So that what the leader, of the, what the president of the Mormon church says uh, is doctrine, or is, it at least has a very strong uh, role. And what people like Adam Miller and, uh, sorry for you, Lincoln, um, even Lincoln, what they say will maybe not have much effect on the general laity. So um, it's important to realize that there's a lot of room for speculation. There's not a lot of room for coalescing these things. So I remember as a kid having conversations with my brothers and my friends about, you know, when we become gods, what will it be like? And it's there's not a lot of clear doctrine about these things, so there's a lot of room for speculation. But within this conversation, is there room for transhumanism? So my focus uh, in the next 10 minutes or so will be to talk about soteriology, eschatology, a few mi miscellaneous issues, and perhaps the chance for uh, rapprochement between um, things that I think are discordant in LDS theology, LDS doctrine, and transhumanist ideas. So um, I'm not going to, I think uh, Lincoln's definition of transhumanism, if you just keep that in mind, that like throws a lot of what I'm saying out the window. So what I'm going to be talking more about is the sort of projects of people like Max Moore, Ray Kurzweil, Hans Moravec, um, and others, and just thinking of that as a way of uh, approaching this question. So first we begin with soteriology. How are we saved? Um, this is an image that Lincoln probably recognizes. 
and that the rest of you probably don't. And let's see if I can move you out of the way so that people can see this. Uh, as Lincoln mentioned, agency or freedom to choose is a very important part of Mormon thought. And this is not like a secret message. Um, if you have the missionaries, the Mormon missionaries talk to you for more than a, a minute, they will <laughs> probably show you a similar um, image to this. So this is basically um, the whole, they call this the plan of happiness and the plan of salvation. This is what Mormons believe from before you're born to what you're doing now and to what happens after all is said and done. And so what we're looking at, we're asking, well, how do we go from here to there? How do we end up being saved? Um, what is What goes on during that that point or that, that moment? Um, so uh, to begin with, uh, it's important to note that um, mainstream Christianity, uh, at least some forms of Christianity, allow different accounts for soteriology, for the atonement. Um, substitutionary atonement theory, if uh, one of the systematicians can correct me if I'm wrong, does not really appear in its formalized uh, form until Anselm of Canterbury, uh, especially in Cordeus Homo, if I'm not mistaken. But there are alternative accounts even today. Um, Dennis Weaver wrote a book called The Nonviolent Atonement, which is a very interesting text. Uh, Walter Rauschenbusch, an American theologian, the, the, one of the proponents of the social gospel movement, said that Jesus doesn't die when he dies for our sins. It's not to take on our sins, but it's because of human sinfulness that Jesus died. So there are alternative versions, but within the LDS Church, um, Substitute, substitutionary atonement theory is predominant. And we see this, um, especially in Moses 6.57, where uh, God says, Teach it unto your children that all people everywhere must repent, or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God, for no unclean thing can dwell there or in his presence. So first of all, we have to know that to be with God, you have to have no sins. Well, how do we not have any sins? And the answer comes from Doctrine and Covenants, uh, verse chapter, uh, section 20, verse 20 through 25, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, verse 22 is important. Jesus suffered temptations, but gave no heed to them, and then he was crucified, died, and rose on the third day, and 25, that as many as would believe and be baptized in his holy name and endure to, in faith to the end should be saved. So, human beings are saved through Jesus, right? Our souls have to be free from sins, and the only way that can be done is through a sinless sacrifice through Jesus. And in fact, um, this is a, another image that Lincoln probably grew up seeing a lot. I saw this a lot in uh, chapels all over Utah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit, it's a bit heterodox. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. So. There's, a, there's a transhumanist moment there, isn't there? Christosis. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of question, well, Mormons had this question for a long time, when did Jesus take on our sins? And as far as I'm aware, there's not a specific doctrine about, or a specific text that points out to what, what, where this is, but many Mormons believe that it's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, while many of us non-Mormon Christians believe that when Jesus went into the Garden, he prayed, he had a hard time, he felt uh, he asked God, he asked the Father that he should not drink of the cup, but the LDS Church takes it a bit farther. In Doctrine and Covenants 19, it says, uh, tells us that the suffering that Jesus experienced was so great that he bled from every pore. And this is Jesus taking on our sins. He uh, takes on, uh, and it's so difficult for Jesus to take, to take on these sins that it causes him to bleed from every pore. And he does this uh, in order to save us. Uh, he partook, for, partook and finished his preparations for us. So uh, if we repent, then because of Jesus doing this, we'll be saved. So um, this tells us that Jesus, and here we get a sort of play on the first image that we saw, that the map, road map. Um, Jesus becomes a central figure, and... and uh, what Jesus did throughout his life, and especially his atonement, taking on our sins in the garden and being crucified, becomes an important part of us being 
saved. So one of the considerations I had, which was already sort of brought up in a way, is that within um, transhumanist thought, there doesn't seem to be a need. And I'm going to come back to this because I think I think you brought up some good points, Lincoln, that um, there may be different views of, of in transhumanism, but there's certainly not a need within transhumanist thought for Jesus. So this, I think, as Mormons are thinking about um, about transhumanist ideas, this should be a, a moment at least to pause to think about if Jesus is not needed, is this um, going to be useful at all? So this is the first part, just the sociological part. The second part I have to go through much more quickly, eschatology. And you already talked a bit about eschatology, so I can skip through some of this. Um, again, we get to this roadmap, but we're looking about what happens after we die, where do we go from there? And it's important to note that there's a distinction in Mormon thought between salvation and eschatology, or it's exaltation. Let me move your head again, Lincoln, so people can see this. Um, there, we'll just get rid of that, uh, that verses. So, um, and I was reminded about this for a paper I was trying to publish. Um, there's a distinction here. When Mormons talk about salvation, they're talking about people who, and you can't see this now because I, I shouldn't have put Lincoln's head there either. Oh, now I don't know what I just did. Here we go. Okay. So uh, there's a beginning after we die, we get sent to either spirit paradise or spirit prison. And those who are in paradise are those who we would clearly say are saved. The analogy here is to most Christians' conception of heaven and hell. Uh, not a not a huge distinction, but after uh, after Judgment Day, then the cards get shuffled. Not really. Those who are in paradise get sent to a greater kingdom, uh, either the terrestrial kingdom uh, or the celestial kingdom. And these are supposed to be very nice places to go as well, better than what we have here, according to Joseph Smith. So all of these people are saved. Those who are exalted are the ones who go up. Uh, Celestial kingdom. And these are the people who become gods. So it's important to note that not everybody who's saved, at least in traditional Mormon thought, is exalted, and not everybody who and everybody who is exalted though is at least saved in a, a traditional Christian sense. Um, so what Lincoln has been talking about has been mostly a, a, an understanding of what exaltation is. But the important part about exaltation we have to note is that it's connected to. And what is this building? the temple, the Mormon temple. So um, it's connected especially to things that are called covenants and ordinances. And I'm going to skip through some of these. An ordinance in the Mormon church is basically similar to um, a sacrament in the Catholic church. And so they include things like baptism, confirmation, uh, communion. Um, they also include uh, marriage, being ordained to the priesthood, and they include a few other things like the temple endowment, um, blessings. There is confession as well in the Mormon Church, but it's not considered an ordinance. So you have this, uh, like a lot of the same elements, and most of them are considered ordinances, um, though not all of them are. So the fourth article of faith um, says we believe that the first are faith, uh, basically baptism and laying on of hands, but these are important for exaltation. As we look at uh, Doctrine and Covenants 84, I'm not going to read this, unfortunately, because we don't have time, but it says, therefore, in 20, uh, the ordinances, in the ordinances thereof, the power of godliness is manifest. So that becomes an important point. Uh, these ordinances are seen by most Mormons as necessary for exaltation, for becoming gods. And again, among the most important ones, we have baptism, we have confirmation, we have communion. And the one that's is perhaps the most significant, this is actually not a stock image, this is my brother. Uh, he got married in the Boise Temple. You can probably see a family resemblance. Um, is marriage. And in Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, and this is a long section, so I'm not going to read it, but it says that... Um, Basically, that the temple marriage, the new and everlasting covenant, is important for becoming gods and for becoming godlike. And of 
course, this is of course the the issue with this is one of the central concerns these days in uh, critiques of of Mormonism, especially with LGBT persons and their uh, the, the way that the Mormon Church does not or has basically the same opinion of most other churches that. LGBT persons should not be able to be married within their tradition. This is important because marriage is, is an important and necessary component of exaltation. So if you're a lesbian and you can't get married, you can't be exalted. If you're gay and you can't be married, you can't be exalted. And this is, uh, Bob Reese does great work, has been doing great work with the LGBT community and the LDS church for the last 20 or 30 years. This is one of the main concerns, one of the most the strongest pains a lot of people in this tradition has. This is also one of the, the great uh, scandals of polygamy. It, it's connected to this in this same section. It talks about polygamy and how polygamy is part of this. So the issue at hand, though, is where in transhumanist thought does celestial marriage fit in? And we see perhaps in Ray Kurzweil's talk, he talk in his writings, he talks about this deeper connection to people, and it's very, I think what you said about Kurzweil reading Tayar was is probably right on the money. I get the same sense as I'm reading him. It's like, but there's no there's no theological, like, you know, Tayar is still trying to be a, a Jesuit at the end of the day. You don't see the same thing in, in Kurzweil, but he does have this discussion about being deeper in love through uh, uploaded connections. But of course, he also talks about being able to be in love with multiple people and separating after a while. And this is something that would be very, um, uh, would be an affront to a lot of LDS people and their, their understanding of monogamous, uh, eternal marriage. So there's, there's that issue um, to begin with. And then the second one, and I'm not going to show pictures because I know this is a very important and sacred um, component is what's called the endowments uh, in the Mormon temple. And uh, the endowments uh, must be received before marriage, chronologically before marriage. If you're going to be married in the Mormon temple, you already have to have taken out your endowments. Uh, most of the time in the LDS church, men do this before they go on their mission. Most of the time, women do this before they get married. It doesn't have to happen that way. My younger sister is a good example of this. Again, I'm the only one who's apostate in my family. Everybody else is a good, faithful Mormon. My sister did not go on a mission. She's not married, but she already took out her endowments, and she lives in Rhode Island, so she once in a while goes up to the Boston Temple. Uh, but it's a necessary part for this, this process. Uh, the endowment process uh, includes um, just a uh, quote from uh, LDS Temple's website. You have to move your heading. Oh, what did I just do? You can tell I'm not uploaded yet because I would have this mastered. So far as I can see, you're uploaded. Uh, so um, there are four aspects. The first is preparatory. It's also when you receive your garments, the Mormon underwear, for the first time. The second is instruction. The third is making covenants. And the fourth is feeling the presence of God. Uh, the instruction part is the part I want to focus on here because it's essentially a type of Gnosticism, and I say this knowing that that has a lot of negative connotations, especially with our systematicians in the room, um, but it's really secretly and fairly strongly guarded. People who went through the temple, as I did not, people who went through the temple and then left the church, sometimes they publish accounts of what goes on there, and that's very controversial within the Mormon church. That's very frowned upon, and it's seen as a, a, a direct attack against Mormon teaching. So this is part of the reason why I didn't show pictures of what goes on there. Um, you can find them, but this is supposed to be a sacred and a, a mostly confidential experience. But there is this instruction that's handed on to the people who are there. And of course, what this means is that there's secret, sacred instruction given to those who take on this ordinance, and only those who take on this ordinance, then only those who have this certain knowledge can be exalted, not saved, but exalted. So this is a form of Gnosticism, the kind that we saw back in the third and fourth centuries when people would get together and they would receive special sacred knowledge and sometimes it was strange stuff and sometimes it was not so strange stuff. But the, the belief that you have to have a certain knowledge in order to be exalted is a component of this. 
Um, and lastly, um, there are two, two miscellaneous aspects that are just worth considering. Uh, the first is what's sometimes referred to as the wisdom of the world, not the word of wisdom, which is also talked about with, within Mormonism. Mormons tend not to have a very favorable opinion towards um, outside thoughts or, or thoughts that propose alternative visions of, of human being, human nature, of salvation. Um, Brigham Young said in 1852, the wisdom of the world which sometimes is referred to as the philosophy of the world. The wisdom of the world is smoke like the fog of night, and uh, it will disappear before the warmth of the sun's rays. God will dissipate it through God's revelation. So uh, there would be some concern about the thoughts of transhumanism, the goals and the projects, and whether that is um, a sort of admixture, an adulteration of true Mormon thought. And uh, the second issue is that we already talked about what... Um, Lincoln mentioned before that Matt, that uh, spiritual the spirit is material, and there becomes a concern, especially with uploading consciousnesses, of how do you upload a spirit into the computer? How can you do such a thing? Um, I'm just gonna. I had some other thoughts. Um, so where do where do they meet? I think um, we see a couple areas, and I think I think uh, Lincoln's comments, his talk was very a good way of talking about this. We also see some interesting, strange uh, connections. Um, there are, this isn't, I think, taught very much anymore, but Mormons used to talk about Kolob, the planet or star where God supposedly resides. And if God is living on a distant planet somewhere, then it's very possible, or even perhaps it's not a distant planet somewhere, it's actually uh, the planet that God grew up on, and He's simulating us. But if that's uh, that would allow for for God to be really a superhuman being um, that that interacts with us, I think Mormonism also provides good boundaries for transhumanism to follow. I think things when we talk about humility, solidarity, communal vision, um, and a lot of other principles and ethical standards, Mormonism can provide those for transhumanism when we often don't see in the writing of some transhumanists those standards. When you have limits, when you have rules, when you have, and the Mormons are very good for taking care of the poor, for setting up uh, bishop storehouses where they feed the hungry in their congregations, or um, donating a lot of money to charity. I think those are good things that could be could be transmitted to transhumanism and benefit the movement in a good way. So, uh, thank you. I don't know if we want to um, open up for questions. Can you see them now? Yeah, I can see them.
transhumanism is that transhumanism has the potential, just like the atomic bomb, or should I say nuclear energy, to make either a bomb or a hospital uh, more effective. Um, that what happens, what would happen to you, uh, Lincoln, uh, if uh, a group of transhumanists were to do something really horrendous and a lot of people would get harmed, would you say, oh, but that's not true transhumanism? No true Scotsman! Uh, a prostituted version of transhumanism. So do I hear you right that you've got the, the principle of the good built into your definition of transhumanism, and if any transhumanist does an evil thing, then that's not true transhumanism. Is that the, your argument, or I just really want to look at it through your eyes here for Yeah, that's close. I don't have a platonic view of the good. I'm a pragmatist. Um, I admire Platonism. I think there's a lot of value in the thoughts and the in the tradition. Um, <clears throat> but my my sense of morality arises much more pluralistically. I think that morality um, arises from the hard work of reconciling differences in values, and that values arise from a, a, plur, a plurality. So when I talk, but beyond that, most of what you said, yes, I, I would agree with. You know, when I when I talk about transhumanism, I emphasize that it needs to be about ethics, but I'm not going to say that it's clear in advance. You know. To, to any given person, what ethics must be. You know, maybe from a God's eye view, ethics is clear, but for all of us, ethics needs to be held as always something we can learn better. And then, you know, um, combining that with this idea of dynamic constraints, this idea that, you know, evil applications of technology will be self-destructive, at least dynamically, if not even impossible to create. Um, then, as you rightly observed, combining those two is why I care so much about transhumanism. And frankly, it's why I care so much about Christianity and why I care so much about Mormonism. For me, these are all tools to shape our psychology towards creating a world that's more um, aligned with the kinds of values that I and people I love have. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Reinhold Niebuhr wrote a book called Moral Man and Immoral Society. He could have better titled it Amoral Society. And in his thesis, he said that any uh, collective organization group was essentially amoral, that morality was something uh, that applied to the individual because they could choose. And he would say, I think my reading of Niebuhr's thesis is that um, even churches as collaborative behave according to their own survival and therefore do not choose and therefore are amoral. Technological advances, if you look at the history of invention, is um, certainly influenced by organization, <clears throat> is not uh, an individual activity. Um, arguably happens in communities that are dispersed. Um, invention happens uh, in concentrated um, networks, perhaps, which you could argue are not um, organizations. Um, but like markets uh, react, networks uh, don't choose. Um, they connect. Um, so what I'm hearing is um, um, something that's missing in your thinking, and it may be just because I'm not hearing it, but that is the role of the collective, which may quite possibly be amoral. Um, I, you know, 
Niebuhr was slightly depressed, probably, <laughs> and uh, depressing. But um, in industrial Detroit at the time, you know, I came by that naturally. But um, it, it seems like the factor of um, organizations to control the means um, of innovation the resources and certainly channeling um, is a factor that I don't hear represented in the thinking of, uh, and, and I'm, I'm wondering, did I miss it? Well, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the thinker that you were talking about, but it sounds like he and I would disagree on the nature of morality. Uh, morality for me is not um, merely an individual matter. Values are individual matters, um, but no subset of values is morality. From, from, um, Levi talked about Mormon conceptions of atonement, and he mentioned what is a popular um, interpretation of the atonement, but it's not the only interpretation of the atonement among Mormons, and it happens not to be the one that I embrace. Um, for me, atonement is morality. And atonement is reconciliation. It's about the, the give and take of values and working to reconcile them with each other. It's exemplified in Jesus saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, but ask anything you will of me and I will do it unto you. Um, for me, that that's Jesus exemplifying atonement. Um, and, and so when I look at the topology of values, the values that you have, the values that I have, the congruent and competing values that everybody else has. For me, morality and atonement are in working through those and trying to make place for them all in the world to the extent that they're not oppressive. And there's a lot of complexity hidden in that little phrase to the extent that they're not oppressive. Um, but this, this sense of morality I inherit to some extent from, you know, my Christian and Mormon interpretations of my <clears throat> my religion, but I also owe it to some extent to um, the pragmatist tradition of philosophy. Uh, William James has influenced my perspective on that a fair amount, and another person who's influenced my perspective on morality quite a bit, and this surprises a lot of people because this person's very often perceived as anti-religious. Um, I think that that's only narrowly true, and, and that would be Nietzsche um, and his perspectives on morality and the relationship of, of um, what he called the overman to morality, I think is insightful in many ways, but insufficient. I think he, uh, he, he, he uh, never got around to explaining how a community of overmen might persist to get together. And um, if you can answer that question, then I think what you get is morality. What I think, I think what you get is atonement. I think what you get is Christ not interpreted as pity, but as interpreted as real compassion and reconciliation. So, um, you know, getting back to the idea that, that groups are, Im, are amoral, um, that would be interesting to explore. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm human and I'm limited and I'm, I'm, I'm open to being educated, but that sounds like something that I would disagree with and argue against may follow up. Um, there was a part of my presentation that, uh, because of time constraints, because I was overambitious, uh, we didn't get to. And it was uh, as an ethicist, I, I also have concerns. And one of the concerns that I have is this issue of uh, moral epistemology. How do we know what the right thing is to do? And one of the thinkers who's been most influential on me, and this is, um, this is of course, uh, in this room, actually, we have two ethicists, um, and we don't agree on everything, even though we're both in the Catholic tradition, even though we're both talking about technology. So you get two ethicists in a room, and you probably end up with three opinions, and then they'll bring in their different theories, and you'll end up with ten. Um, but one of the most influential thinkers for my, my own formation has been Emmanuel Levinas, who was, um, among others, he was one of the few who you can really point to as a person at, who has more reason than most to hold grudges against others. He was, uh, he, his in, instructors were Edmund Fitzgerald and Martin Heidegger, 
Heidegger became a Nazi and Husserl had to leave the rectorship because Husserl was a Jew. Levinas ended up in a prisoner of war camp fighting for the French resistance while his wife and daughter ended up in a uh, refugee camp during the war. And he taught that the most important thing, the way that we know what is right to do is to see the face of the other. When the other appears before us, their face calls out to us and demands our acting on their behalf. And one of the concerns I have is that it becomes easy to lose track of that when there are no faces. Uh, when we don't have a face to look at, how do we know what our moral responsibility is? And I, this is a, a, a profound question because Levinas is contemplating this in the midst of his teacher Heidegger betraying not only Husserl, who was his student, but Levinas himself, uh, Hans Jonas, uh, Hannah Arendt, all of whom were Jews, and Jonas and Arendt had to, they ended up fleeing to the United States because of Nazism, and their teacher sort of abandoned them. Uh, this is an important consideration. How do we know what the right thing is to do? And a lot of ethicists will tell you the body is an important part of that. Yeah, um, for, for for what it's worth, and this, this would take longer than we might have time to discuss, I've got a paper being published soon um, in a compendium of works about religion and transhumanism where I respond to Adam Miller's thoughts on um, the relationship between Mormonism and mind uploading. And I think that there, to the contrary of what, how he positioned it in a paper he wrote last year, I think there is a strong case that mind uploading is consistent with Mormon metaphysics and that it's not, a, that it's a misunderstanding of of mind uploading to conceive of it as disembodiment. But anyway, that's a teaser. Go look at the paper if you want the theological and doctrinal reasoning behind, and, and technical reasoning behind my perspective. I think there was another hand out there. <laughs> I, was so, I was really inspired by the last great commentary because they really seem to meld together in exactly what you just denied, and that is that when I look at the, the history of human development, but the contemporary psychology, anything, I don't get any of the, the evocation of what we might call moral behavior with another that we didn't learn through being in a body. And not just any body, but a body that is uh, available to die and available to get hurt and available to all sorts of privation. That's why we need to see the face of the other to be able to produce our thing. It's because the face is telling us that that person in their body, in everything, has experienced something that I really consider to be very relatable, something that is maybe I've, I've even experienced almost direct. But without that, I'm just calculating machine. I, I, I can't bring to bear uh, any of the virtues that we consider to be primarily the best of humanity and verging onto the best of the spirit. It's, you don't get there as a code. I, I just don't I just don't see that. I, I don't see any way to get there. And I don't see anything in Mormon scripture that, that would even allow for that to start. Essentially, Mormonism says, no, you do this stuff. And then God intervenes and something else happens and the reason why Mormons don't talk about it is because they can't imagine it, what that other is after they leave this mortal coil and, and attain to another. And I think that that's, I, I think that what transhumanism and Mormonism together are getting close to doing is what we used to joke about when I was an undergraduate in physics. We used to make fun of, of different uh, derivations for how things happen, like how life came about. You, you write a bunch of equations on the blackboard, and then you put it like a crooked line, and you say, and then a miracle happens, and we get this. And I just don't get the connection. I, it seems like you're hoping for something, and you're reading uh, a lot of experience that you have as, a, as an embodied mortal human being, understanding your embodied mortal life, but then you're throwing this immortal thing on it and saying it's just an extension of that. And I, I really I can't get there for you. Um, I I don't I don't know what you're asking exactly except that I'm getting 
I'm I'm understanding you to be making some assumptions that I might not share with you. And that is, for example, that there's value in a negation of um, this life, that like maybe heaven or immortality are negations of this world or this life. Um, if that's the case, I, I don't share those assumptions with you. Um, I, you know, when people think about immortality, they very often think of it as, as maybe the opposite of mortality. Um, and I don't share that assumption. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I've been raised interpreting Christianity differently than that. You know, when I read Paul talking about the idea that we'll not all die, I think that's a really cool idea. But, you know, more simply, I, I guess getting to maybe a heart, the heart of, you, you kind of touched on a practical question. You know, are we, are we kind of like putting this magical thing up here and hoping for it? No, we're doing exactly the opposite of that. I don't know very much. I know what I value. And I know what tools I seem to have available to me and how I might be able to use them. And so what I'm doing and what my religion has taught me to do, at least insofar as I inherited it from my parents and as I understand it to be impinging on me presently, my, I, I know that I can use these tools to shape the world a little bit more to be in accordance with what I value. And that's what I'm trying to do. And one of the things I value, one of the things that my Christian and Mormon education and, and life's lessons has taught me is that cooperation with, compassion for, and loving other people um, is something that makes my world more worth living in. So I value it. I want to be in that kind of world. And I want to use the tools that I've got to motivate others to, to help me build that kind of world to the extent I can. I've got limited power, you know. This isn't, for me, this isn't, you know, Lincoln can do this. It's quite the opposite. I don't think any of us can do this alone. But I can do something. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand my religion. I'm trying to understand my skills. I'm trying to understand the technical um, and, and resource, the, the technical things that we have, the resources we have available to us in ways that I can make a practical difference, that I can make sense of, that I can use optimistically but still realistically. So I, I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I'm not holding out for magic. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that my religion mandates that I don't hold out for that magic thing to happen. My religion mandates that I work within the grace of the opportunity presented me to transform our community and our world to be the heaven I hope for to the extent I can contribute to that and to motivate others to do the same to the extent I can motivate them. So for me, this is a very practical thing. Christianity is about very practical things. Mormonism, transhumanism, these are about, about very practical things. Yes, we have these fantastic visions, but their function is to motivate and inspire us. And they're going to be wrong, at least to some extent. That's the only thing we know for sure about those visions. They're going to be wrong. But they still serve a function, a practical function today, insofar as they motivate me to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to educate my children and to use technology to connect with people and to build them up rather than to disconnect and tear them down. And that's what, in all practicality, what Mormonism and transhumanism, particularly when combined, function to do in my life. That, that is my experience with them. Um, I can see why some people might look at, look at it from a merely theoretical perspective and say, well, you know, it's, it's the extension of teenage boy fantasies. And that's a criticism that gets targeted at transhumanists all the time. But let me tell you, if it's a teenage boy fantasy, it's the kind of fantasy that makes me happier, like a better, happier in a way that you should care about because I, I like do more pro-social so, pro stuff because of it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of fantasy that my wife and children appreciate because I'm not going around being an atheist anymore, which I was inclined to become in my 20s, which would have torn apart my family, as it turns out. That's not the case for all atheists, but that's the, that's the trajectory I happened to have been on. Um, Mormon transhumanism saved me from, from that problem. Um, it's the kind of thing that motivates me to want to go out and help people in my neighborhood with the tools I have. 
because it, it, my understanding of my religion is that, listen, God is not going to save me or anyone else unless I make use of the means God has already provided. That's like core to what my understanding of religion is and core to my understanding of Mormon transhumanism. So, you know, condensing all that down, my response to the idea that this is about wishful thinking in the future, I'd say is exactly the opposite of that. I don't know for sure what the future will be. I'll imagine and speculate with you because it's darn fun. But these things affect me now. They change the way I act now. They make me a better person right now. And that's what I care about. Ted. Hey, um, uh, I'm glad that uh, Levi uh, reminded us of the uh, soteriology. And in my own mind, Lincoln, I'm trying to see how the transhumanism fits with classic LDS commitments. So let's imagine 150 years from now, Ray Kurzweil turns out to have been correct. A singularity occurred a post-human, post-biological species with superintelligence has arisen. And evolution has left Homo sapiens behind. Everyone in this room and you are dead. And the only sign of life is the post-singularity disembodied intelligence. How does Mormon, how would you as a Mormon eschatologist Yeah, so first of all, I, I, would, I would suggest to you that there's no such thing as, in, as disembodied stuff. Disembodied minds, disembodied bodies, disembodied anything. Everything's embodied, even if it happens to be uh, bodies that are different than the bodies that we experience right now in some way or another. Information only exists in our computers in embodied ways. It's encoded into bodies. It's encoded into silicon. It's encoded into electricity. It's encoded into any kind of pattern in physical material stuff. So we're always going to be embodied. I think that's an important thing to start out with. Um, and bodies will change, you know. Um, from, a, from a religious perspective, n n not even going with just the Mormon stuff, you know, you, you go into the Bible and it talks about bodies changing in the Bible. How will our bodies change? You know, there are some Christians who would argue that, you know, the body is something to be forever put aside. They seem to have an idea that we, there is some kind of disembodied future. But there's, I think, a strong case to be made from the Bible itself, not even using unique Mormon scripture, that embodiment is important. And so, you know, as we go forward in this future of Kurzweil that you described, and, and, I, and I lay out a narrative for this um, in the paper. If, um, for, for those of you that um, haven't read it, I invite you to, to read that and you, you, can get, you can get some more detail. But um, as we go into this future, I think we can start with this notion that first of all, there's a physical transformation from the kind of mortal bodies that we have now to bodies that transcend what our present notions of aging and death are. That doesn't mean that they face no more risk. That doesn't mean that we're somehow aiming at some kind of superlative environment where death is absolutely impossible. Um, I, I'm not a Platonist. I don't believe um, in superlatives except to the extent that we um, kind of imagine them as, as like these infinite progressions from things that we actually experience. But, but so a first step would be, hey, well, let's make our bodies live longer with greater health. Um, Maybe that, that, that can constitute a transfiguration, as talked about in the Bible. In Mormon thought, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and other Mormon leaders talked about an ordinance of transfiguration that um, people would gain in the latter days, or in the last days, as Joseph Smith described it, which would transfigure us um, beyond what we currently consider as mortality into some kind of immortal state, but not a final immortal state. Joseph Smith described it as there being another transformation that would be required after that. And that other transformation, he described it as resurrection. So even beings that never died 
would still need to be resurrected, according to Joseph Smith. And he, and he and Brigham Young also described that as an ordinance that we would perform for each other under the uh, you know, guidance of God, the inspiration of God, however that plays, might play out. And so we would undergo this other transformation to resurrected bodies that are yet more robust. How would that, you know, what might they be? Um, how, how could they be more robust than that? Well, you know, we can speculate theologically, religiously, we can speculate technologically. Um, maybe bodies that are composed of information are more robust. But I think there's a prejudice against those sorts of bodies as if they're somehow not real, as if they don't have a face anymore because they, you know, why wouldn't they? Why would we choose to become things that don't have the function of the face, that cannot appear with greater beauty than, you know, what we've already achieved? Why would we choose to do that? You know, maybe we would be forced to in some kind of um, dark scenario, but, you know, I hope not. That's not what I'm aiming for. But at the same time, you know, we can imagine embodiment in ways that are facilitated by nanotechnology, by information technology, that would be much more robust, that would allow it so that if you did get hit by an asteroid on Earth, your body could still be reconstituted with all of its memories on Jupiter, and you'd still be alive. So, you know, distribution of your intelligence and your body would make you essentially immortal for all practical purposes. Um, but, you know, again, that's super speculative. I, I don't know how that will turn out for sure. But what, what I'm, what I'm trying to drive at is that there's, there are many things in the scriptures, the Bible and in Mormon scripture and in Mormon authoritative tradition that suggest that there are steps towards this new embodiment and that this new embodiment um, can be understood as divine, as heavenly, as sublime, full of intelligence and light and love, but that doesn't mean that there's no physical aspect to it, that there's no physical explanation for it. And in fact, I think that it's very impractical of us to assume that there's not some kind of, you know, sufficient cause, some kind of explanation for how we get from here to there. And in fact, it would be that more traditional idea that God magically poofs us into some other state that seems far more impractical that seems far more like magic thinking. And, and it's transhumanism, in fact, that's helped encourage me more than even, you know, kind of my more naturalistic Mormon inclinations as a child even did. Transhumanism has encouraged me to move away from the more magical thinking religious positions towards asking myself, okay, well, let's say these prophecies and these visions that we hold so dear can be attained in, in some way, to some extent, within, you know, you know, maybe maybe all they are outlines of a gist and thrust of possibilities that we don't have the anatomical capacity to comprehend presently. But maybe we have a pathway to walk a little bit further towards them. Maybe God has graced us with some opportunities that we ought to take advantage of. You know, what have we got to lose in trying? And, you know, there, there are answers to that question. We could lose something. But I, I think we stand to lose far more if we don't try than if we do. That's the stance I take. It's an optimistic one, it's a, but I think a practical one as well. Um, Lincoln, I want to give you a log to uh, add to your fire that's obviously burning. Um, and I appreciate that very much. It's a log I bet you would not uh, encounter, but I urge you, it takes you back to Jesus. And it's a book that received all sorts of awards um, by the Society of Biblical Literature when it was published um, by a gentleman who's no longer with us, Walter Wink. And he wrote a very thorough, um, exhaustive, uh, and unprecedented look at Jesus' use of the title Son of Man. I love it already. It is translated actually the Son of the Man. And all the New Testament translations avoid that because it's so awkward. But, um, and it's called The Enigma of the Son of Man uh, by Walter Wink. 
Very cool. Pine and Wing's thesis, um, which surprised a very conservative group called Biblical Scholars at his uh, scholarship, um, that Jesus um, clearly and undeniably pointed to himself not as the Son of God. That's what other people said of him. But he did point to himself as the Son of the Man. And what he meant by that has been an enigma for the faith for 2,000 years. And um, Wink's thesis was that what Jesus was doing was pointing to authentic humanity. I love it. And in the heart of authentic humanity is divinity. I love that. So I, I, I recommend you take a look at it. I will, for sure. That also reminds me, you know, Levi was talking about the soteriology and the importance of Jesus in Mormon soteriology, and he's exactly right. What I what I don't think he brought up, and and probably for you know there's some good reasons because Mormons tend not to bring it up or even know about it as much, is that our scriptures, Mormon scriptures, um, to some extent in the Bible, but even more so in unique Mormon scripture, attribute all of the titles that Jesus has to, to Jesus' disciples, to you and me, that we should aspire to taking on all of the same titles, all of the same capacities, to do the same works, to take on the same identity. Um, and, uh, you know, it's part of the, this process of theosis. And so when, when a Mormon who is inspired by those aspects of Mormon tradition looks at the, the parts of the scriptures that talk about what Jesus does and what Christ does, we understand ourselves to be part of that, to be called to be part of that. That when it's talking about Jesus Christ doing these things, it's talking about not only Jesus as one person, but we as the body of Christ doing that with Jesus, by Jesus' call, through the grace of God, contributing to it. So um, just to kind of add an additional step beyond the base soteriology that Levi pointed out that uh, works well with what you just brought up about the relationship between Jesus as being the son of the man, as you put it, which I like a lot, and also the other titles that Jesus has attributed to him in the Bible and elsewhere. Saviors, Redeemers, Christ, Messiah. Ben. I really love the last part um, after Levi's presentation where he brought in the Levinas critique. Um, and, and I think um, most of Levi's presentation applied more to kind of a mainstream or a traditional uh, historic interpretation of Mormonism and kind of highlighted that Mormon transhumanism is an interpretation of Mormonism. That that um, we're not teaching mind uploading in Sunday schools. Um, but so um, and I and I think that's really important. And I think that Lincoln um, is playing for sure the most important role in the Mormon Church in kind of well first to set the stage a little bit that. The church is in a difficult position with a lot of people leaving the church, uh, especially the younger generations leaving the church. And I think a lot of it has to do with this interpretation that Levi was talking about, that we're, we have this complex of technological capability, and as Lincoln is describing, we're, we're able to see these visions of heaven almost within our grasp, and at the same time, the church is talking about these dogmatic teachings and pointing to these abstract notions as the solution for everything. Um, and I think Lincoln is doing a great job for Mormonism, and I think for religion in general, in saying, but we can, we can recuperate some of these things. And I wanted to just ask Lincoln to talk on, Levi talked about ordinances that we talk about ordinances as, in Sunday school, the answer you would get is, yes, ordinances is how you get saved. 
but I've heard Lincoln talk before about the role ordinances play in salvation, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, I, happy, happy to. Thanks, thanks for teeing up the ball, Ben. Um, in the Book of Mormon, there's a really beautiful passage that talks about, so for those of you who don't know, the Book of Mormon is, the, is a story about a people that purports to be ancient Americans. And these ancient Americans um, live the law of Moses. So they're Jews. They came from the old world to the new world. Uh, and they're practicing the law of Moses and its rituals and such. So there's this beautiful passage of the book where um, it, it talks about why they live the law of Moses. And it says they don't live the law of Moses because they suppose that salvation comes by the law. And now you're going to hear some echoes from Paul in the New Testament in this. They don't live the law of Moses because they suppose that salvation comes by the law. But they live the law because it serves to strengthen their faith in Christ. And so take that, and the Book of Mormon also re teaches the, its reader that, it sh that we are supposed to liken the stories in the Book of Mormon to ourselves. So if we are to liken that story to ourselves today, we can say, okay, well, let's say, um, let's, let's call the rituals and ordinances and ceremonies that the LDS Church practices today, let's call them the Law of Brigham, after Brigham Young, the, the Mormon prophet that led the pioneers to Utah and established a lot of the modern order of rituals for the LDS Church. Let's call that the Law of Brigham. So why do Mormons live the law of Brigham. Well, some Mormons will tell you it's because salvation's in the law. But that's not what our scriptures teach, I would argue back. Our scriptures teach that we live the law of Brigham because it serves to strengthen our faith in Christ. There's a practical, motivational aspect to this. Um, Levi quoted DNC section 19, talking about the atonement of Christ and, and how it saves us. Right before the passages of scripture he quoted, there's a really fascinating passage where in the voice of God, Joseph Smith says that God uses his words to act upon the, the minds, the spirits of man to have an effect on them. It's like this, 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 this radical opening of pragmatic intent given in Revelation. So Mormons are supposed to take away from this passage of scripture that, listen, when you read these things about atonement, about the suffering of God, about the suffering of Jesus, contextualizing that is this claim that this is supposed to affect you in a certain way. It's supposed to have a practical effect on your psychology. And so going back more specifically to Ben's question, you know, yes, there are many Mormons who think of rituals as in themselves the, the, you know, the key to salvation. My response to that interpretation of Mormonism would be, no, I think you're misunderstanding the utility of the ritual. The ritual is there to affect us, to provoke us, to change us, to transform us, to be a tool in the toolbox to help us take on the identity of Christ more profoundly, more thoroughly more persistently, with more energy, with greater strenuosity, to take it more seriously and to kind of, if you want to use um, a more colloquial expression, to level up and to take more steps to, to follow the example of Jesus, you know, to go out and do the things that will make the world a little bit better place. That is the function of ritual. It's the function of prophecy. It's the function of religion. It's all forth telling. It's all motivational. It's all transformational. And, and in that, you can see a strong relationship back to transhumanism, where if transhumanism is about change, and if I want transhumanism to be done in a particular ethical way or, or in accordance with some aesthetics that I value, let's say they're the Mormon aesthetics, then why should I not use ritual, use the way that we shape our community to provoke each other towards goodness? towards love, towards kindness and cooperation and compassion. If our rituals are doing that, they're functioning correctly. If we're understanding them to be motivating us in that way, they're functioning correctly. If our rituals are making us Christ, conforming to the image of God as exemplified by Jesus, they're functioning correctly. If they're not, if they're making us legalistic Pharisees, then they're a waste of all of our time.
I mean this in the, the kind of, uh, I don't mean this question to pinion you or embarrass anything, but I, I'm curious, I'm really curious. Yeah. When you look back at a lot of the, um, the, the spiritual writings and the prophecies of both uh, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, uh, like through the Journal of Discourse, you get this amazing panoply of just uh, of ideas that are that really stretch the imagination. Yeah. And now, in our current chronology and situation, as you see it, we're living in a technological world, not developed solely by Mormons, but just a, a technological world that's blooming, that's taking us to this potential new reality. Uh, as, as you see in the interpretation of transhumanism with Mormon theology and Mormon uh, prophecy. So my question is, if this is really true, I mean, you, your projections, and if Mormonism still is supposed to be the vehicle of revealed truth, then why is it that the 20th century saw almost no prophecies of the sort of vibrancy and, and, and redirection. It seems like now is when they should be talking about transhumanism. I mean, I, it would seem to me that if Brigham Young were alive today, and if he were president of the church, he'd be all over it. But they're not. So what does that say about the church currently and its responsibility to be that channel of revelation and, and where you're going? It, it seems to be a big disconnect. They, yeah. Know, yeah, so, you know, what is the function of a church? What is the function of the LDS church? Um, early on, as you pointed out, man, Brigham could speculate with the best of the futurists today. They had nothing on that guy. Brigham Young had some pretty, um, you know, pretty grandiose visions for humanity. And, of course, he had developed those under the tutelage of Joseph Smith. These guys, um, you know, whether you consider them prophets or not, whether you consider them good people or not. These guys were creative and in the very least, if not, you know, as I consider them, inspired people. Um, you know, do, why don't we see that so much today in the top leadership of the LDS Church, for example, is your question. And, you know, di different Mormon transhumanists will give you different answers to that question. There are some Mormon transhumanists that are not LDS at all. Um, some never were. Some of them come from different branches of Mormonism. Um, some Mormon transhumanists were never Mormon at all before becoming Mormon transhumanists. They're a very small number, but there's a few of them that exist. Um, but most Mormon transhumanists are LDS. And the LDS Mormon transhumanists will, will give you also different answers to that question. Some of them will say, well, it's because, you know, the, the church is... Um, not living up to its potential. So they'll give you maybe a kind of a, more, a little bit more negative spin on it. Um, some of them will maybe give you a little bit more positive spin on it, saying, well, that's just not the, you know, that's not a, the central um, purpose of the church in the complex world that we live in today with membership all over the world with different understandings. Their job from this perspective is to share a very simple message, the core gospel of Jesus Christ, and to get that spread as far as possible. And, you know, my response to that is that, you know what, that's not such a bad thing if we can focus on that. You know, the church isn't going around denying um, our doctrine of theosis. If anything, the LDS church teaches that idea more than any other Christian denomination I know of. But we also don't emphasize it a lot. What we do emphasize a lot are very simple things. We emphasize the basic, what we, what we consider the core doctrines of the gospel of Christ, faith. Repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, service, enduring to the end, charity, compassion. We emphasize those things, and I don't think that's such a bad thing in a complex church to take as most of your emphasis. I think there's a lot of pragmatic value in that. And this gets back to, you know, our discussion earlier about, um, you know, how do we get from here to our visions of, you know, radical transhumanism, assuming that something approximating them is even possible and, and achievable. Well, from my perspective and the perspective of many people, Mormon and not, um, we're going to have to learn more than just how to answer technical questions between here and there. We're going to have to learn how to live together better. 
and I'm thoroughly Christian. I, I'm inspired by Christianity. I think Christianity is a great response to the question, how do we learn to live together better? Um, I think it's a transformational question. I think if we truly try to live the gospel of Christ, it can transform us. And, you know, a lot of people get hung up on some of the, on some of the words, uh, which I think are, you know, the, the words are aging. The words that we have in our scriptures, they're aging. People aren't understanding them maybe as, as instinctually or as viscerally maybe as the early Christians understood them. Uh, one way that I sometimes express and reword for modern sensibilities the gospel of Christ is as trust in faith, change toward, that's repentance, and full immersion in the role of Christ. Full immersion both body and mind in the role of Christ. That would be like baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost. I mean, think about think about how when you internalize that gospel, it's all about my transformation and your transformation to conform to the image of God as exemplified by Jesus Christ. And when and when we think of it that way, and when we look and we look at Jesus' words, you know, do the works that you have seen me do. Be perfect like your fa- like the, my Father in heaven is perfect. When we internalize these things, when we try to act on them, my, my experience is that it does change me. It does motivate me differently. I behave differently when I try to live those really quite simple ideas. So to get back to your question, you know, the church is focusing on some very simple things. It's not talking about the technology of transhumanism. That might, there might be some practical benefit to that. But at the same time, think about what the LDS church is doing despite the fact of its very simple message. Why on earth is the LDS church collecting hordes and hordes of genealogical data? Some of them, some Mormons will give you very superstitious answers to that question. My answer to that question is, well, hey, it's the best thing we can do right now to, to um, set up the database for the resurrection. That might sound silly, but um, I, I, think go, I think if you go home and ponder that idea for a little while, and if you try to ask yourself, how would I get started with resurrecting all of our dead ancestors? What would I do today if, if anything is possible at all to do? I think you would find that genealogy is a really good start. Now, maybe it won't work. I'm not telling you it necessarily will. I'm telling you that if you're looking for something practical to do, if you thought that you could participate in any way, that you were supposed to participate in any way in realizing the resurrection, in participating with God in realizing the resurrection of humanity. What would you do today? I would say go home and do your genealogy. And the Mormon church emphasizes that. Why? You know, we, we, we talk about it. It's because it's the love for our ancestors and stuff. My wife's bringing me a glass of water. You want to meet my wife? Uh, this is Dorothy. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Dorothy and I met when we were both LDS missionaries in France. <laughs> I embarrassed her because she wasn't really fully good. She's in her pajamas. Um, anyway, um, what was I saying? I just got derailed. My wife has a way of doing that to me. Genealogy, database for resurrection. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so look at what the church is doing. The church... The church is engaged in massive wel- welfare projects. The church is engaged in massive genealogical projects. Um, and, you know, I think that those are some practical steps that people can be taking. Now, are there other things I wish the church would be doing with its vast financial resources? And they are vast. The LDS church is very wealthy right now. Um, yeah, there are other things that I'd like to see them do, but I'm not in charge and I, I can share my opinion and maybe someday somebody will listen to me. But in the meantime... I'm personally not disappointed that the church focuses as its core mission on teaching the gospel, the simple core gospel of Jesus Christ. I I find a lot of value in that. Thank you all very much for the invitation and for letting me be here. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, Levi, for the response. I'd love to have access to it in written form if you've got it. I have it as an outline, so I can try to write something more more concrete for you. Either way, I would love it. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Good night.